Hi, it's John, and in this video we're going to take a look at the Tamron 150-500mm Super Telephoto Zoom Lens for the Nikon Z mount system. I've already published two videos related to this lens, one addressing an image stabilization quirk when shooting video attached to the Nikon Z8 body, and the other went over the autofocusing capabilities of the lens. I think these videos are worth watching if you're seriously considering buying this lens, but I'll look to summarize the key takeaways from those videos later in this video. Quirks aside, the Tamron 150-500 is quickly becoming one of my favorite lenses, and I hope this video will help demonstrate why that is. So why was I in the market for a new super telephoto lens? I shoot a lot of photographs of my kids doing outdoor activities, and having some extra reach is very useful. I previously bought the F-mount Tamron 100-400, as well as the Panasonic Leica 100-400 version 1 for use on my Olympus EM-1 Mark III body. While both were optically decent, neither has reliable continuous autofocus for fast-moving subjects on the bodies I have. So any replacement lens has to perform well for action photography. My recent video on the AF performance of the Tamron 150-500 shows it has very capable autofocus acquisition and tracking capabilities. We'll take a look at some of those tracking sequences later in this video. So let's spend a moment going over why I bought the Tamron 150-500mm lens rather than what is its closest competitor in the Nikon 180-600mm. I think at a high level it comes down to how you prioritise cost, size, performance and reach. Starting with cost, the Nikon at $1,700 is $500 more than the Tamron lens. And looking at the size, the Tamron unzoomed is much smaller than the Nikon. Though consequently, the Nikon has an internal zoom, which many favour. On the zoom range, the Tamron is more flexible at the short end, though the Nikon wins out for overall reach. A key feature of a super telephoto lens is image stabilisation, and here I think the Nikon is the likely winner. Both lenses test well for sharpness, and differences are likely to be indiscernible in real-world usage. The Nikon has the advantage that it works with teleconverters, whereas the Tamron will not accept them. For me, cost and especially size are the key differentiators when it comes to a pretty specialized lens. And I feel I'm much more likely to grab the Tamron than I would the Nikon when I go out to shoot. The unmounted Tamron fits nicely in my Peak Design 6-liter version 2 sling bag. With the 150-500 mounted to the Z8, it fits comfortably into a Peak Design Sling 10 liter. Choosing the Tamron over the Nikon 180-600 is highly personal. And based on the popularity of the Nikon 180-600, people will have different priorities. Okay, so let's physically compare the 150-500 to a couple of other lenses I use on my Nikon Z system. Here's the 150-500 next to the F-mount Tamron 100-400mm with the FTZ adapter together with the Nikon Z70-200 f2.8. At the shortest focal length, there's not much between them. When zoomed to their longest focal length, the two Tamrons are again very similar in length. For me, lens size is a significant factor when taking a lens off the shelf and taking it out to shoot with. But once that commitment is made, often your enjoyment of the lens comes down to its weight. Let's take a look at how much the lenses weigh. So here's how the three lenses line up. Now let's compare the 150 to 500 against the more likely cross shot options. The 180 to 600 is a bit of a bruiser and is a product of its longer focal length and internal zoom. The 100 to 400 is itself also longer than the Tamron 150 to 500, while being shorter in focal lengths at both ends of the zoom range. Weight wise, the Tamron falls roughly in the middle of the two Nikons. I've used the Tamron a number of times on stints lasting up to a couple of hours. I've managed to handhold the lens on a Z8 body, raising the camera up when there is action to shoot, and otherwise lowering the camera. In these circumstances, I've found the size and weight to be very manageable, but I'd imagine if you're shooting more continuous action like soccer or basketball, it may be more of a challenge. That covers the physical dimensions of the lens, so now let's take a look at its other physical features. Starting on the underside of the lens is a USB-C port, which can be used to update the firmware with the Tamron Lens Utility software. Surprisingly, there is no cover or grommet to protect the port from gunk or water, though I understand the bare port is resistant to water. I thought I'd check out the software update process, so I downloaded the Tamron Lens Utility software onto a Windows Surface Pro 7 computer and attached the lens using a USB-C cable. The software recognised the lens and checked for the latest firmware, reporting back that the firmware on my copy was the latest version. I also checked the customised lens option, but this merely repeated the firmware update check. I'll have to try this on my Mac to see if I get similar results. 
Anyway, it's a pretty quick and painless process to check whether the firmware needs updating. Let's turn our attention to the switches on the lens barrel. The Z-mount lens features three switches rather than the four found on the Sony and Fuji versions. The Z-mount version is unique in featuring a linear, non-linear switch for manual focusing. When non-linear is selected, the lens changes focus based on how fast you rotate the focus ring, whereas linear changes focus based on how much you rotate the focus ring. Based on the brief testing I performed, this works as described. Let's take a quick look. Non-linear allows you to quickly change the focus point with a quick twist of the focus ring and then accurately fine-tune it as you approach the focus point by turning the ring more slowly. By contrast, linear predictably changes focus from one point to another based on how much you rotate the focus ring, irrespective of how fast the focus ring is rotated. This would be helpful for focus pulls in video. The second switch is the regular autofocus manual focus selection. And the third switch in the cluster is the focus limiter. It has three options between full range, minimum focus distance and 10 meters, as well as 10 meters to infinity. I've played around with the switch and it does its job. Here are some photos taken at my daughter's baseball practice. The lens would often focus on the net of the batting cage. By setting the switch to 10 meters to infinity, it forced the lens to ignore the netting. The Fuji and Sony versions of the lens also feature switches to control image stabilization. These are omitted in the Z-mount version and are controlled in camera. We'll go into image stabilization in more detail a little later. The lens also features a zoom lock and something Tamron calls a flex zoom lock. The zoom lock only operates when the lens is fully zoomed out to 150 mm and prevents any zoom creep. Where the Tamron differs from most other lenses is the flex zoom lock which can be engaged at any focal length. It seems to employ a friction clutch that prevents focal length changes unless it's disengaged. You can physically turn the zoom ring if you apply plenty of force but you really have to make a concerted effort. Moving on to the lens hood. Tamron has rubberized the front of the lens hood, which should reduce scrapes and dings. It's a nice touch. So finishing up with the physical features, Tamron has thoughtfully included an Arca Swiss compatible tripod collar. And the design also allows for the collar to be removed without detaching the lens from the camera body. While it would have been nice to have included a customizable lens function button, it's not a deal breaker. And all around, Tamron has given us a thoughtful design for the money. Now let's take a look at build quality. Tamron have built weather resistance into the lens and have included a fluorine coating on the front element to disperse water and resist dirt. While I haven't used the lens in heavy rain, the lens schematic shows Tamron incorporated nine seals throughout the design, which should provide a good level of weather protection, though possibly not as good as the internal zooming Nikon 180-600. Overall, the lens appears tightly put together and solidly constructed. The lens has a short throw zoom ring, requiring just 75 degrees of rotation to travel from one end of the zoom range to the other. The zoom ring is large and operates smoothly, so no complaints there. The focus ring is on the narrow side, but it also operates smoothly. The switches are recessed to prevent accidental changes, while at the same time feeling positive when moved. One oddity I did notice is there is some play in the lens mount that I haven't experienced in my other Z-mount lenses. I attached the lens to a Z8, a Z6 and a ZFC, and they all had similar amounts of play. The issue isn't just isolated to my copy of the lens, as it was raised in the comments in my autofocus test video by users R. Hogarth and MJack993. The play in the lens mount doesn't seem to impact the operation of the lens in any discernible way, and after being initially very aware of it, I've largely forgotten it since. Otherwise, the lens feels robust. So now we've covered the feature set of the lens, let's take a look at how the lens actually performs. Let's start by looking at the autofocus speed. In my recent autofocusing test video of the lens, it's clear the lens is fast at changing focus. Let's emphasize the point by comparing the autofocusing speed between the 15500 and the older Tamron 100-400. Putting the lenses side by side, the performance advantage of the 150-500 is clear. The 100-400 is accurate, but it just takes longer to achieve focus on the subject. It's also apparent how much louder the focusing mechanism is on the older lens. I imagine the use cases are limited for operating these types of lenses for video while using the camera's inbuilt microphones, but the noise may be a consideration for some. Tamron notes that VC is controlled in the body. Checking the options in the camera, the Z8 offers the usual off, normal, or sports options. No other VC functionality is apparent. 
when I turned on the VR in the camera body, from some limited initial testing, the image stabilization seems to do an okay job for stills. I didn't do a ton of testing here, as I typically use fast shutter speeds to freeze action with this type of lens. So image stabilization when shooting stills isn't very important to me. However, I would definitely benefit from effective image stabilization for handheld videoing of sports. When shooting video with the 150 to 500, vibration control seems okay at 150, but is pretty shaky at the 500 mm end of the zoom range. I was shooting with VR set to normal, though I think maybe the sports setting would work better, as the regular setting looks to hold onto the subject as long as it can before it readjusts with the lurch. I'll need to do some more testing here to better evaluate this capability, but a quick comparison with my 70-200 f2.8 at 200mm showed the Tamron to be less stable. And I'd also hazard a guess that VR on the Nikon 100-400 and 180-600 would be better than the Tamron 150-500. I did spend some time assessing the use of electronic VR in video mode. I found that stabilisation was worse when both EVR and regular VR were enabled on just the Z8 body. As mentioned, I created a separate video showing my findings. Let's take a look at the minimum focusing distance of the lens. I'm not a big macro guy, but I do appreciate a lens where, in regular shooting, you don't have to back up to get an object in focus. Tamron quotes the minimum focus distance is around 24 inches at 150 millimeters and 71 inches at 500 millimeters. I slapped a tape measure on it, with the lens at 500 millimeters, it measured approximately 64 inches. While my methods were not lab quality, I'd be surprised if I was off by seven inches. In any event, it's a very useful minimum focusing distance that has real world benefits for general photography. Just a quick comment about chromatic aberration. In general, I don't look for it and I rarely find it. The Tamron seems to control this well. As for specular highlights, they have a noticeable cat's eye shape, which I don't find unpleasant. Next up, let's cover sharpness of the lens. Over the course of the three months I've owned the lens, I've taken many thousands of photographs and have been very happy with the resolution of the lens over its focal range. I've read Dustin Abbott's excellent review of the Sony version of the lens where it approaches the performance of the Sony 200 to 600, especially in the center of the frame. I've also read a few comparisons of the Z mount version against the Z100 to 400 and 180 to 600, where some say it outperforms and others reporting that it underperforms. I was initially going to present these findings as adequate to support my anecdotal observations of the sharpness of the lens, but given I don't own or have access to any of those other lenses, I felt relying on other people's assessments would leave me lacking any useful insights. So I figured I should compare the lens against other lenses I do actually own. So I set up a test chart in the form of a PS5 box. I then leveled up and squared my camera to my test chart. Firstly, I shot the Tamron 150 to 500, Tamron 100 to 400 and Nikon 70 to 200, all at 200 millimeters. I shot the Nikon at f2.8 and f5.6 to see if there was any significant change in resolution. I think the Nikon at f5.6 is marginally sharper in the corners than at f2.8, but this perception may be due to the exposures not being quite equivalent. Looking at the images, it's clear that the Nikon 70 to 200 has a slightly wider field of view compared to the 100 to 400 at 200 and the 150 to 500, which was notionally at 196 millimeters. Let's take a look at the center of the image at 200 millimeters. The 150 to 500 hangs well with the 70 to 200, even when we punch into 100%. The 100 to 400 is looking a little softer than the other two lenses. As we punch into 200%, I think the 70 to 200 is a hair sharper than the 150 to 500. The 100 to 400 is now obviously worse. Looking at the corners, the Nikon at f2.8 and f5.6 are noticeably better than the two Tamrons. The 150-500 is slightly sharper than the 100-400. Looking at the midframe and punching into 200%, again the 100-400 is noticeably worse than the others. And again the 150-500 is close to the performance of the 70-200. I'm pretty impressed with that given how well regarded the 70-200 is. Let's move on to 400mm. When I zoomed the 100 to 400 out to 400 millimeters, the recorded focal length of the 150 to 500 was 370 millimeters at the same distance, and I feel I matched the field of view pretty closely. So taking a look at the center, even at 50%, it's obvious the 150 to 500 is sharper than the 100 to 400, and even more evident when we punch into 300%. Taking a look at the corners at 400 millimeters, the 150 to 500 is clearly sharper now than the 100 to 400. This story carries over to the mid-frame performance. 
the 150 to 500 is again well ahead of the 100 to 400 here. Now let's finish up our test chart analysis by comparing the 150 to 500 at 500 mm to its performance at 400 mm. I move the camera and lens further away from the test target to get a similar field of view as my 400 mm shots. I did an okay job at it, but the framing wasn't quite perfect. That said, I think it provides some insights as to the sharpness of the lens's longest focal length and demonstrates that the image quality doesn't degrade significantly, if at all, as we zoom out to the longest end of the range. So wrapping up my sharpness testing, the 150 to 500 performs better than the 100 to 400 in every area I evaluated. The 100 to 400 is close to the 150 to 500 in the corners, but the 150 to 500 is better than the 100 to 400 across the rest of the frame by a clear margin. When comparing the 150 to 500 to the Nikon 70 to 200, I was very impressed with how well the Tamron held up to the Nikon from the center of the frame out to the mid frame. The 150 to 500 falls off towards the corners and cannot compete with the 70 to 200 there. But overall, it's a very good result and I'm very pleased with the sharpness of the lens. Now let's take a quick look at the autofocus acquisition and tracking capabilities of the lens. As already mentioned, I've done a separate video evaluating the 150 to 500's performance here, as I think it's crucial for a lens of this type. My findings were very positive, but let me summarize them briefly. I've shot many thousands of pictures with the 150 to 500 and a bunch of different scenarios, including sequences of World Cup skiers, indoor soccer, outdoor soccer, baseball training, cars, bicycle, birds in flight, and fighter jet flybys, to name a few. With some caveats related to birds in flight, I found that the autofocus acquisition and tracking of the lens to be very reliable for all of those scenarios. This is reliant on the user understanding how to use the autofocus settings on the camera to get reliable results. And I think my limitations on birds in flight may be remedied by using a different focus area mode based on a recommendation from a Jan Wegener video I recently watched. But overall, I'm very happy with the autofocus and capabilities of the lens, and with the lens in general. So let's wrap up this video. Let's start with the negatives, because it's a pretty short list. The 150 to 500 does have a couple of quirks. The EVR anomaly when shooting video on the Nikon Z8 and the play in the lens mount seem like oversights by Tamron, though I hope the EVR issue can be fixed by a firmware update. And I think the VR in general is likely worse than its Nikon alternatives. In spite of those niggles, I think that Tamron has made a very compelling alternative to the first party Nikon lenses. It has a strong feature set and performs well, all wrapped up in a comparatively compact package at a price significantly lower than its immediate competition. The optical performance is strong, especially towards the center of the frame. My style of photography typically has the subject towards the middle of the frame, and so corner softness is rarely a consideration for me. Also, I'm very happy with the ability of the 150 to 500 to acquire and hold focus on a subject. I found this works well for a variety of fast-moving subjects with a range of backgrounds. And given it's significantly smaller than the Nikon 180 to 600 millimeters, which means I'll happily grab it and chuck it in a bag and head out. Due to the size, the Nikon 180 to 600 would sit longer on the shelf between outings. So in conclusion, this is a really nice product from Tamron that fits in very nicely with their recently released high quality, keenly priced lenses that they have released in the last few years. So that wraps up the video. If you have any questions or observations about the lens, I'd love to hear them. Thanks for checking out the video. If it's been helpful, please like the video, subscribe and leave a comment below.